Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, uh, snowstorm. Uh, it's always nice to come from Jerusalem to the snowstorm. And, uh, and to take up some very important issues, which I'm very concerned with, and I hope that we can have an exciting, relevant, uh, constructive debate on these and maybe other related issues. Um, just to not to, to correct the Hebrew there, but just uh, on record, at, beside, at just as present, I'm for the last couple of years the chairman in the Knesset of the Education, Culture, and Sports Committee of the Knesset, uh, and of the uh, Jewish Arab Coexistence Caucus and of the Environment Caucus in the Knesset. Those are just my present positions. We change the whole time. It's difficult to keep updated, but uh, that's what, at present what I do, amongst other things. I uh, would like to go into this issue of maybe taking a little historic perspective uh, first, and then to go into the issue, maybe talking a little beyond the issue also, what uh, concerns me. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit. You said it's soon uh, uh, the 60th birthday of the State of Israel. And take us back where the Jewish people was 100 years ago. Uh, 100 plus years ago, 90% of all the Jews in the world were living in the extended Poland. Less than 10% in Western Europe, in uh, America, in North Africa, more than 90% in the extended. Extended Poland, including about six states and so on. The Jewish people was in a situation of immediate threat. No Jew knew when you were getting up the next day to what you were getting up. It was in a threat of a physical extension under, uh, under a totalitarian or different totalitarian frameworks, and, uh, and which led to, of course, the, well, the, the catastrophe uh, of, the, uh, of the 20th century, the, uh, the Holocaust, uh, the biggest crime of, Jew of human history. Uh, but led also to the battle of survival of the Jewish people, and the most prominent of the movement of survival was Zionism, which uh, led to the creation of the states of Israel. But Israel was thrown into, uh, into a creation without a lot of thought, except that this was first of all to be the haven for the Jewish people, to solve the problem uh, of the threat to Jewish existence, the problem of anti-Semitism, uh, and, and, and there was a thinking in the active socialism, socialist Zionism, a thinking also of creating a new Jew, um, especially also because the areas where Jews could be active in uh, centuries of, of exile were very limited. And suddenly, coming back to your own homeland means also to <coughs> reestablish what the Jewishness of, of this homeland means. It doesn't necessarily mean, as was said in the introduction, being a Jewish state does not necessarily mean a religious democracy as you defined it, although it's an interesting definition. Uh, but there was a lot of different thinking about this but the state was set out and it's beginning to go without this thinking being established in the establishment of the state. And the truth is that only now, 60 years after, we really, and still not yet, have come to terms with what we really mean by saying Israel is a Jewish state. Sometimes I thought about it here when very close to this place where we're sitting now, in Annapolis uh, a very short time ago, there was a very strong Israeli demand uh, to the Palestinians that they should define us a Jewish state. And I commented in Israel, in the Israeli public on this, maybe we should start defining ourselves as what we mean by a Jewish state, then we can ask the Palestinians to do this afterwards. And by the way, I accept the basic notion, which also the Palestinians, by the way, accepted in Annapolis, uh, of two states for two peoples. Uh, which also means that the state of Israel is the state of the Jewish people with, of course, the relationships which we'll talk to to the minorities in the state. 
But there were different concepts which led to compromises and status quos and other kinds of deals in 1948, which we're dealing with today. As you know, Israel does not have a constitution, but Israel does have an, was established on the basis, which for me is the biggest miracle of the, of the creation of the state, the Declaration of Independence, which is a very, very important basic document for understanding the states of Israel, how it got on. And probably, there is probably no point in Jewish history, not before and not after, that you would have had a situation where every facet of Jewish life signed on one declaration, one agreed upon declaration. This is, for me, the uniqueness of the establishments of the states of Israel. Everybody, from ultra-capitalists to communists, to sworn communists, from liberalists and, and uh, secular uh, atheist fighters to the segments of ultra-Orthodox Judaism, Hasidim and Mitnagdim uh, and, uh, and uh, Reformed Jews and Orthodox Jews and whatever. The whole spectrum. Everybody signed that document. Please come in, there are more places here. 2,000 years ago, we had a big Jewish scholar sitting in the snowstorm uh, uh, outside. He was called Hillel. And, uh, uh, but we let people in here. Please have a seat. <coughs> OK. <coughs> the truth is, very interesting truth, which very few people know, that Israel was not, in the Declaration of Independence, defined as a democracy. It doesn't say anything about it. I think that it doesn't say anything about it. It was so obvious that nobody that, you know, didn't even think about writing it in the document. But only in 1992, in what's called in Israel the basic laws, Chukei Yisod, was the concept of Israel being a democracy introduced as a basic, uh, as a basic law in Israel, although Israel functioned fully as a democracy also uh, till then, and the especially established a whole series of laws uh, establishing the democracy. And first of all, the Supreme Court, which has a very unique function in Israel, which doesn't have in any other country in the world, uh, gave a, a considerable contribution to the concepts of basic human rights and, free, and, free, and civil freedoms in the upbuilding in all the years of the state, which became part of the up, of the judicial upbuilding of the state, what it did state in the Declaration of Independence is that Israel is a Jewish state. By the way, the party name, which you had the somewhat difficult, but you did a very good job, called <laughs> Meimad. Meimad is the letters of Medina Yehudit, Medina Demokratit, a Jewish state and a democratic state, which is also the name of, of my party. But um, the question is, what does it mean that it's a Jewish state? And is there a tension between the Jewishness of the state and the democracy of the state? Now, it depends how you define the Jew Jewishness of the state of the sta in the states of Israel. Uh, if you define it from a narrow, narrow Jewish Orthodox definition, then there are tensions in the freedoms with Israel as being a democracy, with full civil rights as a Western democracy, and with the interpretation of the Jewish religion as it is. And this tension, first of all in Israel, comes to its expression in two areas. One area is the area which, and let me define how I define at least the state of Israel. The state of Israel is not a religious state. It's not a theocracy. Uh, there is a relationship between states and religion in Israel, but that doesn't mean that Israel is a religious democracy. I functioned as chief rabbi, still actually, it's good to have fallback positions in politics, still the chief rabbi of Norway. Norway is considered to be a country with full uh, liberties and human freedoms and, and so on, but Norway is a Lutheran state. It by defined by its constitution. The king has to be Lutheran, the majority of the government has to be Lutheran. The Lutheran religion is the state religion, which, got, which controls, all, and, and there is far more liberties in Israel for minority religions than there is in Norway for minority religions. 
So, so therefore, the, the, the establishment of it being a religious, uh, of the connection of religion and state has nothing to do with, with uh, attacking the democracies and personal freedoms of, of the citizens of the state. It's, it's important to establish this. Um, I remember I was in a very critical forum in the Berkeley University some time ago. It turned out not to be so critical. There were a couple of thousand students there. In any case, I got one critical question. How can Israel claim that it has religious freedoms to the non-Jewish population <coughs> in Israel when it has, uh, even in its state st symbol number one, its flag, it has a star of David, uh, Magin David. And I said, you know, with all due respect, the country where I'm the chief rabbi, which is considered to be a full democracy and so on, has a big cross in its state symbol, the flag of Norway. By the way, not only of Norway, but of all the Nordic countries. So that in itself doesn't mean anything. It depends what the rules are, the rules of the game. Now, what Israel has done is Israel is a, a, secular, a secular civil democracy, I think you can define, which has given authorization, a religious authorization according to the law of the states of Israel in certain areas. The most important area being the area of family uh, jurid jurid jurisdiction. 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 And there you can say that from a pluralist civil liberty point of view, Israel is, does not have that level of uh, freedoms in this area as uh, any other Western democracy has. Does not have. Not everybody can marry each other in Israel. For example, a Jew and a non-Jew cannot, under Israeli law, get married in a, in a Jewish marriage and not in a non-Jewish marriage. There's no civil marriage at all in Israel. There are religious marriages, but no, you can't get married. Uh, inside, let's say, the Jewish System, a person who is a Kohen, who is of, a, of the descendants of uh, Moses' brother Aaron uh, Kohen, cannot marry, cannot marry in Israel somebody who, uh, a woman who is divorced. Cannot get married according to Israeli law. Um, that's one area. And the other area is what here in this country is generally considered as religious pluralism which is uh, the area of the relations to the non-Orthodox uh, segments of Judaism, who in Israel do not have the rights under the law that the Orthodox segment of Judaism has, which means that, that uh, a reform rabbi cannot perform a wedding or perform a conversion to Judaism in Israel according to Israeli law. Um, well, that's... That's uh, one issue. However, the state has established uh, in a series of laws uh, both freedom of religion and freedom from religion and based in a series of laws uh, which also have to do internally inside the Jewish system and also with the minority religions in Israel. And then I won't mention here all of it because we don't have time. Just mention a couple of the laws which is important. For example, a person of any religion can choose his, the, the day of Sabbath or the free day in the week according to his religion. So a Muslim who works in uh, any work in Israel has a right to take Friday as his day off, a right which doesn't exist, at least in Norway. I don't know how it is in America. Uh, in Norway, you can't do that. In, in Israel, you can. Or a Christian, likewise, on, on the Sunday, uh, can take that as his day off. The same, of course, with other religious uh, holidays. Um, there is, in Israeli law, a very strict criminal law against f people being offensive of religious reasons to, any, to, any, uh, relig to, to anybody of any religion. Uh, in the school system, there is a very quite extended pluralism of thoughts of different systems and different uh, for different religions, and also inside the Jewish religion, you have Reformed Jewish schools, you have conservative Jewish schools, and you have Orthodox Jewish schools of all of the different kinds, and you have secular schools. You have, according to the law in Israel, civil burials, not civil marriage, but civil burial system under the law. 
where I think we should be going in this issue, I think we should close down the tension on this issue by doing two things. One, I think we should, we should minimalize the religious legislation in Israel. I think we should open for civil marriages in Israel, which would solve this, and we should open for relating to conversions dividing there between, say, synagogue and state, or church and state, in the sense that saying what? Saying that the state of Israel as a secular state should not deal with who is a Jew, according to my belief. That's a religious question. The state should be dealing with who is an Israeli. And if you deal with who is an Israeli already then, then you take out the, the, the sharpness of the discussion which is between the different segments of Judaism. Because just as you have non-Jewish Israelis, you have Muslim Israelis, you have, by the way, they're not 80% Jewish Israelis. They're hardly 70% because there is a big segment in Israel, especially of the new immigrants who have come from the former Soviet Union, who are defined themselves and by law as not having Jewish religion. We don't even have 70% today who have, uh, who, who have confessed, by, you know, by own definition, by the definition of law as Jewish. But, but I understand why you divided it in this way, because it's true that you have 20% who are the Arab Muslims and Christians. Uh, but, but in any case, we have a, this big segment of more than 300,000 people come from former Soviet Union who are, who are non-defined uh, according to, to Israeli law. We need to establish a, a civil, civil marriage system in Israel. I think that there is growing support for that. Um, even inside the, the religious parties in Israel. Um, we also need to differentiate between conversions, between a religious definition of conversion and a civil definition of conversion. I think that will solve the basic tensions which exist today uh, in the states of Israel. I'm very much against any kind of religious coercion. I myself am an orthodox rabbi. I believe in conversion according to the Jewish law which is according to the halakha, to the traditional Jewish law. If somebody comes to my synagogue and has a conversion, which is a non-Orthodox conversion, I would say that this, they have this defined that this is not a conversion, which I can accept. But as a, as a legislature in the state of Israel, I cannot say that a conversion which is accepted by a big segment of the Jewish people should not be defined as the state of Israel as an acceptable conversion under, for example, the law of return or something else, by defined of who should become an Israeli citizen. And therefore, I draw that line in the difference. On the other hand, I think that the Jewish religion, the Jewish ethics, as, as you rightly presented in the beginning, I think that the Jewish religion should have a far bigger role in the substance of the state of Israel, not in the legislation, not in coercion, but in the thinking, in matters of social ethics, of social of economic politics, of uh, of external relations. I mean, we had a big, when I was at a period as the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, I believe that in our foreign affairs relations, Jewish religion and Jewish tradition and Jewish <coughs> thinking and Jewish history and Jewish experience and Jewish narrative should have a far bigger role than they have. Listen, we have now a very big problem which you discussed here in America also, the relationship to Turkey and to the Armenian, uh, to the genocide against the Armenians. How can we, being Jews, with Jewish experience, how can we, even though we need desperately good relations with Turkey, but how can we avoid talking about the, the Armenian genocide? As a minister in the cabinet, which I also had in my history, by the way, uh, for a couple of years, as the minister in the cabinet, I could not, I could not accept the Turkish demand on this issue. And many other issues. How can we, as a Jewish state, sell weapons to totalitarian states in the world. This is one of the most sharp religious, ethical uh, prohibitions. If you read in the Maimonides and the Rambam, what he says about selling weapons to people who would use it to kill innocent people. As a Jewish state, I'm saying, uh, there are many legitimate interests which we have to look at when we talk about military uh, industry and so on. But as a Jewish state, this should be a part of who we are and why we are. Uh, and, and this for me is important. 
when we talk about our relationships with other religions, and there I want to say, according to Israeli law, we're very good on that issue. I, we're far better on that issue than most of the European countries, at least. On the issue of giving autonomy and, and full religious rights to the uh, my, religious minorities of, of, of Israel. But we have not developed, which I think that we should, our relationship as a Jewish state to the surrounding states, to Islam first of all. And this is a big debate which I think will be central in the debate uh, over the next decade. I think we have an internal problem and an external challenge. The internal problem is that we have more and more people in Israel, I'm saying this in a serious way, who want to define the Arabs out of the Israeli democracy. And there are proposals consistently in the Knesset to this direction. If they succeed, these proposals succeed, Israel will cease to be a democracy. And it's not a given that that won't happen over the next years. I understand. I hope it won't succeed and we'll fight the battle. Because this is a battle, I think, not only of the democratic soul of Israel, also of the Jewish soul. There are many people, also in this country, who look at Israel as a spearhead and to a kind of uh, battle of civilizations, kind of Judeo-Christian battle against the civilization of Islam. In Israel, we also have both leading politicians and rabbis and thinkers and others who go for this concept. This is a very dangerous concept. There's no future in it, there's no hope in it. I think on the opposite, and I have in this, in this area a broad coalition with me, also amongst the orthodox thinkers of Israel, also amongst the ultra-orthodox thinkers of Israel, that on the opposite, Israel should be a bridgehead of a coalition of civilizations. Israel and the Jewish people being like historically in a position with one leg in a Western liberal democratic tradition, and in one leg, both in the East, geographically, but also in the East, in, in philosophy and in tradition and, and in, in practice and religious practice and with, with respect for values which are valued in a world of religion. And I agree with you totally that, that I believe that the 21st century is going to be a century of religion, not only of distance from secular. I don't know if it's good or bad. That we can debate. Depends what kind of religion we're talking about. But this is the development in the world. And I think Israel has a unique role. The Jewish people has a unique role in creating this spearhead. I think that we should start off by creating a religious peace between Judaism and Islam, which will inspire a political process and make it possible, political process which is not doing too well in spite of what's happened the recent week, it's not doing too well. It will not happen without a religious peace between Judaism and Islam. The good news, which I can tell you here, by this I will conclude, what I'm saying, the good news is that it's possible, that there are very strong forces, both on the Jewish side and on the Islamic side. Some of the people you would be very surprised to hear which people are involved, but there are very, very strong forces involved who are willing to do this, exactly this, and who understand that it's good. It's good for religion, it's good for the peoples, and it's the only possibility to create a different perspective, a different vision, a different hope for both peoples living today in the Holy Land. Thank you. So, um, Rabbi Melchior has helped us in terms of timing, since most everything I was interested in focusing on, he is more eloquently than I could have. Uh, already addressed. So what I'm going to do is uh, nuance a few of the points that he made and then uh, leave to Rabbi Shefran to continue and then we'll have conversation. Um, Israel is not dissimilar to Western European countries and to the United States and Latin America in that it struggles with democracy, Jewishness, and I want to add a third feature, I want to nuance democracy because uh, democracy, Israel established itself as the, as, as the nation of the people of Israel. So it, in, it, in its implicit democratic character is that 
Jews, as the majority, have the right in this one place in the world to determine their own fate. That is the notion of a majority, a democratic majority. However, it wrote into its Declaration of Independence what we call the classical liberal um, uh, freedoms that are in the United States in the First Ten Amendments of our Constitution. Right? So it has, it wrote into its Declaration of Independence, freedom, justice, peace, a, com a complete equality of social and political rights for all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex, guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture, guaranteeing the holy places. Those are the liberal rights that are established in a liberal democracy. And then its third character is that of being Jewish. So you have, when you, when you think of this, you have an immediate tension and contradiction which a country often doesn't feel initially. Few of us know that until, 19, until 1828, um, non-Christians could not be elected to, the, to office in the state of Maryland. We don't know about it because it eventually became irrelevant. We kind of say, well, in those first years, they were working out what does it mean to, to what do freedoms mean? Uh, when you think about abortion rights, gay rights in this country, you realize, when you think about um, uh, uh, religious, um, what's the, uh, faith-based initiatives, you realize we're struggling with the same issues here. A legislator or a court, with all due respect to the court that claims that it is beyond this, they're going to be thinking in democratic terms, what does the majority want? Liberal terms, what are the freedoms that need to be, to be protected? but also in religious terms as well. And of course, um, Rabbi Melchior mentioned the, all of the countries of Europe across the board. You know, you can't be Queen of England, King of England if you're not from the, if you're not of the Church of England. In Germany, you pay your taxes to the state that funds the religious institutions. And there we're not even talking about places, let's say in Latin America, where the, or, or, or until recently in some questions still existing in Spain where church, military, government, king, ruler, um, all seem to be uh, uh, interlinked. So Israel has this inherent contradiction, but it's no different, frankly, than the contradictions that we struggle with here, and resolves sometimes on the side of democracy, of the will of the Jewish majority, sometimes on the side of, uh, of uh, individual freedoms, uh, and sometimes uh, on the side of Jewish law, Jewish, Jewish, uh, Jewish tradition. So, so that's the first. I want to clarify: this is not an uh, unusual contradiction, and it is an enormous tension, as it is in any country that believes in democracy and believes in in rights um, as well. The second point is that Israel's confessional structure is inherited. It wasn't created by the state of Israel. It was inherited by the British Mandate and the Ottoman confessional system. So Israel chose in, its, in, in uh, its birth to uphold a system of giving authority to religious leaders to determine for their population that which is, uh, which is law for them. That's important when it comes particularly to the, to the um, Muslim and Christian minority in Israel. Because of this system, there are, there are greater rights to the Muslim and Christian minority to identify themselves as not only Christians and Muslims, but also as Arabs. So that, in a certain sense, the, the, the tensions that exist in Israel for its minorities are tensions that are allowed to exist because the minorities don't identify as Arabs or Palestinians in distinction with Israeli Jews, but they, they have the right to distinguish themselves as Muslims and Christians linked to their Arab identity. So in a certain sense, Arab identity in Israel filters itself through, for better or for worse, obviously, filters itself through the churches, the Protestant church, the Catholic churches, the um, Eastern churches, and also through the Muslim community as well. Israel, to some extent, we could see either supports or exacerbates that. But from our perspective, in terms of minority rights, we have to note that Israel, in upholding the religious confessional system for its minorities, ends up also upholding the right for them to identify not as part of the Jewish majority of the state of Israel. So it's a, and the list, the list of religious groups 
in Israel is huge. I mean, Druze, Baha'i, Greek Catholic, Armenian Orthodox, Armenian Catholic, Maronite, Syrian Orthodox, all of these have rights defined by the state of Israel that protect them in terms of their, their behaviors, their attitudes, and their identity, fi including financial supports as well. Um, I, I want to note at least the question about foreign policy, because I thought it was interesting for me. The frustration for those of us who love Israel um, and are often critical of governmental policies and the behaviors, whether it's towards Palestinians or internally on the issues of the rights of Jews to express themselves, it's ironic that, that Israel actually is able in the terms of religious rights to protect its, uh, uh, its minorities and also to not use Jewish language, or at least in the negative ways, to, um, to determine foreign policy. Right? So Israel has a notion, Judaism has a notion of greater Israel and Israel from the Tigris-Euphrates Valley to the Nile River. You don't hear any debate within the Knesset, or right? maybe any is probably too extreme, but within the body politic, you simply don't hear a debate that Israel should determine its borders based on, in realistically, I'm not saying that they may not in the synagogue talk about those borders, but when it turns to determining policy, you have not heard from any government of Israel using that the, the inherited biblical right to the land of Israel as the basis not only for Tigris-Euphrates Valley to Nile, but even for holding on to the areas conquered in 1967. Whether it was leaving Gaza Strip or the willingness to debate leaving what is truly the heartland of the foundations of the Israelite community of Judaism, which is, which is Ju Judea, Samaria, those areas. The fact that it even can be in discussion, if you hark back to American history and manifest destiny, or to the white man's burden, or to the Russia and to the Tsar's desire for Constantinople, um, the padres who, who, uh, who, who led the conquistadors in, in, in uh, Mexico and South America, you do simply don't hear that language used. So it is remarkable that in spite of this strong Jewish sense of we have returned to this land, which is our land promised us by God, there is a willingness to recognize that when it comes to policy matters and decision making and foreign policy, these are, so to say, not, not operative. The only other area in which I would you know, emphasize uh, it, not as passionately as Rabbi Milk here because, because um, I don't have the right to do that, not as a, not being a, an Israeli. But the recognition from out here that Jewish is not a religious, si simply a religious identity. It's a national identity, a cultural identity. It's a historical association that for many is entirely, is entirely devoid of religious belief. And therefore, this system constructed by the Ottomans, enforced by the British, and, and never mandated as law, but became law. For example, the, the, um, uh, there was a quote I had here from, uh, from uh, Shimon Shitrit, that Judaism has never been proclaimed the official religion of the state of Israel. Rather, the law and practice in Israel regarding religious freedom may best be understood as a sort of hybrid between non-intervention in religious affairs, on the one hand, and the inter-involvement of religion and government in several forms on the other, and by government funding of authorities which provide religious services to several of the religious communities. But this wasn't voted on by the Knesset. This was simply inherited as a system. And in a certain sense, that failed because of the sophistication of 1948 versus of 2007. It failed to take into account the ways in which Jews would identify themselves. They all could sign the Declaration of Independence in 1948. That would not be possible today, for good reason, because it's more than just the marriage of a Kohen, of a, someone from the priestly class to a divorcee, but it's whether the son of a Jewish father who's killed in the, in, in the state of Israel, fighting for the state of Israel, can be buried in a Jewish cemetery. It's whether somebody who is, who's, um, birth was the result of, of a, a forbidden marriage, of an adulterous marriage, whether that person can murder, uh, marry, can marry um, a Jew. The, the, 
the confessional system, which in a sense protects Muslims and Christians in Israel because it imposes itself on the majority Jews, is highly problematic. And as, the, as Rabbi Mecher said, needs to be changed. I want to give on this issue of, of where the democracy is, where, where is the will of the majority. Uh, I checked on the latest surveys dealing with religious rights. 63% of Israelis, Jews, favor giving reform and conservative Judaism equal le legal status to that, by, um, that possessed by the Orthodox tradition. 63% want couples to choose reform and conservative Jewish marriage ceremonies to have the right to do so. 64% want public transportation and weekly Sabbath. 78% um, favor opening shopping malls outside city centers on the Sabbath. I I'm not recommending that this be, that opening shopping malls, I'm only saying that if we want to talk about Israel in terms of a democratic state, of the will of the majority of its population, we clearly see here that it is not, it's not been able to do that. So as a liberal state, it has not fully been able to protect the religious rights, the religious freedoms of its citizenry. I could not perform a wedding in the, uh, in the state of Israel as a democratic state isn't reflecting at the moment the will of its majority. And there I would agree with Rabbi Melchior, as a Jewish state, it has two enormous weaknesses. On one hand, it does not allow the ethics of Judaism to speak more effectively to policy. And at the same time, it does not respect the religious life of the majority of Jews in the world who don't follow the the um, standards set by the chief rabbinate of the state of Israel. Now, one more point, and then I will con conclude. Having said this, and it's a good critique, and it's an important critique, I do want to recognize um, what is a, a kind of heroism of, of a small state, of a Jewish <clears throat> majority that in spite of the fact that it is, there are Muslims who use Islam as a basis to call for the destruction of the state of Israel, continue to allow Muslims the rights of identity, behavior, and belief within the state of Israel. And it needs at least, we need to always keep ourselves balanced in these types of conversations. I may be deeply concerned about policies of the state of Israel towards its Arab minority but not towards its Muslim minority, not towards its Christian minority. And since this is a conversation about religious freedoms as opposed to political freedoms and political issues, it makes me much more comfortable to make that piece extraordinarily clear. They are not the same. Right? Israel protects the rights of minorities within Israel, gives them the freedoms of faith, and respects that and endorses that its issues towards Arabs and their nationalism within the state of Israel, of course, is far more problematic and depends, you know, hopefully at a period of time in which there will be a Palestinian state in which the political rights of Arabs, Muslims, Christians can be fully expressed, and the state of Israel in which Jews can fully express their rights with the protection of their minority as well. I'm going to truncate my remarks with uh, the indulgence of the uh, organizers only in the interest of time in order, to, in order to allow what I think will be the most productive part of uh, this whole session, which is to take questions both from the organizers and hopefully from all of you. I'm not going to repeat the defense of Israel as a, uh, a Jewish state and a democracy at the same time. The others have done that, and indeed that is what it is. I'm no different than many, many countries, and Norway is just one of them. Great Britain's another one that has an official religion. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor, though I would like to, but the time doesn't allow, uh, a critique of Israel's uh, attitudes at certain times uh, toward, toward minorities within its, uh, its borders, because uh, that does uh, demand an addressing, but I don't know that um, this is necessarily the best place for it, uh, considering the, uh, the real topic here. I don't believe that there is any sort of systematic religious bias against minorities in Israel. I think that uh, uh, the inconveniences, and I don't mean to make light of them, but uh, the inconveniences of uh, security concerns that, that are born of concerti security concerns that impact or have impact uh, disproportionately on Arab or Muslim uh, citizens of Israel or residents in Israel or the occupied territories, 
um, are incidental to those security concerns and can't be construed by any reasonable person as being an intentional systemic sort of bias of any sort. What I do think I can add, though, that has not been addressed, and I think that it's an extremely important aspect uh, that no one has mentioned, is the fact that the Jewish state's commitment to religious freedom is enshrined in two documents. One was mentioned by Rabbi Melchior before, the Declaration of Independence, which in uh, the establishment of the State of Israel, which indeed is a remarkable document. But there was a document that preceded it by just under a year. It was signed in June 9, on June 19, 1947, and it's come to be known as the Status Quo Agreement. Now, of course, that date uh, predates the establishment of the state. But this document um, was the reason why, as Rabbi Melchior mentioned earlier, all of the, or most, almost all, of the Jewish uh, factions came together to join in the establishment of the State of Israel including uh, the so-called ultra-Orthodox or Haredi element. Um, it was indeed, this, this document, the status quo agreement, was indeed uh, a, a letter, in the form of a letter, signed to the Agudath Israel World Organization. Uh, it was signed uh, by all the members of the Jewish Agency, which was the precursor to the official government of the State of Israel. And the first name signed to that document is that of David Ben-Gurion, who became, of course, the first Prime Minister of Israel. Um, this particular document is extremely important because it helps define the Jewish part of the Jewish democratic balance here. And it does so in a way that uh, is very limited, and it does so in the uh, same breath as ensuring religious rights for all Jews and non-Jews in Israel's borders. Nevertheless, it does address concepts in effect though backhandedly, because it wasn't a catchphrase at that time, the concept of Jewish pluralism. I'm using the term Jewish pluralism in contradistinction to the concept of pluralism of religions in general. There, as has been noted by uh, Dr. Elcott and by Rabbi Melchior, there um, is full freedom of religion to practice whatever one's religion is in Israel. But the concept of Jewish pluralism, which is the idea that there are multiple Judaisms with widely divergent belief systems, that does present a very special challenge and always has and increasingly does to the state of Israel. Because here we are not dealing with different religions seeking recognition or protection as such, but rather with Jewish groups seeking to broaden and amend, even redefine the state's concept of Judaism. The status quo agreement, that foundational document that preceded the Declaration of Independence of Israel, while it does reiterate the state's commitment to religious freedom, as I mentioned, in the same breath, it also pledged state observance of the Jewish Sabbath as the official day of rest for government offices, the provision of kosher food exclusively in government kitchens, and a system of traditional Jewish religious education for the Haredim. And those are not such important things to most people in Israel today, but the fourth one is, and it was alluded to several times before. It also promised, and this is a quote, everything possible will be done to avoid, heaven forfend, the splitting of the house of Israel into two, end quote, that would result from multiple standards regarding Jewish so to speak, personal status issues, like marriage, divorce, and conversion. This goes to the heart of the meaning of the word Jewish in the phrase Jewish state, because precisely such multiple standards are what heterodox Jewish groups seek to enshrine in Israeli law. Thus far, due both to the historical and the legal importance of the status quo agreement, and the traditional bent of a large majority of Israelis, and it is a large majority of Israelis, uh, the estimate is 80% of Israelis are either Haredim or traditional Jews, which means that they, in essence, subscribe to the concept of halakha as it's understood by the Orthodox world. Uh, because of these things, the proponents of 
creating a new definition of Judaism or Judaisms in Israel have not met with any substantial success, though there have been fine tunings of laws here and there. Add to that the fact that the official, the official uh, Israeli rabbinate is orthodox and therefore currently remains the decisor regards to, to such matters. It's an issue that um, has not yet been resolved fully. That single standard approach, as I like to call it, the press prefers the phrase orthodox monopoly, which I don't think is a very um, objective way of putting it. The single standard approach to Judaism in Israeli religious matters does not have major impact on Israel's democracy because a large majority of Israel's citizenry is either orthodox or traditional, as I mentioned. It does, though, have a tremendous potential of alienating diaspora Jews, like many of us, all of us here, except for Rabbi Melchior. Many of you who are Jewish, as I am, are diaspora Jews for the fact that we are living here. And many of us may be alienated by this lack of embrace of the American multiple Jewish, multiple Judaisms model because many of us have been nurtured on the idea that Judaism is a, a bird of multiple wings. But that has not been the case for most of Jewish history until fairly recently. And in Israel, currently, it is not the case, at least with regard to what the government officially recognizes. And that brings me to the final point that I'd like to make before we uh, open things to discussion. And that is a major concern for at least those of us who do consider the status quo agreement to be an inherent and important part of Israel's Jewish identity. And that issue is the state's highest court. A comprehensive review of the Israeli Supreme Court and its arrogation of power to itself uh, deserves a separate symposium. But I would like to at least note here that the secular revolution and that's a famous quote, that mindset of former Chief Justice Aaron Barak survives his tenure, both in the precedence that he set when he was a sitting Chief Justice, and in the like-mindedness of the justices who are still sitting. And of course, it's a self-perpetuating body, so one can assume that it will con continue in perpetuity uh, to reflect that attitude. It has been widely documented and just as widely decried that the High Court in Israel has taken for itself the role of legislating, which is not its official role, not just legislating, but legislating by fiat, in disregard of the Knesset, in disregard of the societal consensus, and in disregard even of the military establishment, and certainly the religious establishment, toward the goal that the court has set for itself of empowering what it deems to be the, quote, fundamental values of democracy, and that's Mr. Barak's words, the court remains guided by his infamously audacious declaration that everything is justiciable. Everything can be brought, nothing is beyond question. Everything can be brought to the court for reevaluation. That attitude is what brought the respected American judge, Richard Posner, to call Mr. Barak a judicial buccaneer and an enlightened despot. And Professor Robert Bork, wanted to award the former Israeli Chief Justice the, quote, world record for judicial hubris. That says something. But the Israeli Supreme Court may... Robert Bork, it definitely says something. Well, he knows of what he speaks. What the Israeli Supreme Court may in the future choose to deem enlightened or unenlightened is anyone's guess. But an educated guess would certainly yield more than a modicum of concern in the heads and hearts of those who consider Israel's Jewish character to be essential to its identity. One can only hope that Israel, Israelis themselves recognize that a dictatorial and non-representative branch of government, no matter how enlightened it perceives itself to be, is in the end antithetical to the idea of a democracy. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, I was afraid for, for a few minutes there, as we used to say in the South, that we were going to have a men corner. Uh, but, uh, no such fears here. That, uh, that uh, did not happen. I'm delighted that it did not. Um, this is just right. We have about 25 minutes uh, for 
questions and answers. And by the way, we have a um, well, we have some food downstairs after this is over, and we invite you all to join us. Uh, but to whet your appetites, now we're going to involve you in the discussion. I, I think a good way to begin this might be to afford uh, Dr. Elcott and uh, Rabbi Melchior the opportunity to respond to a couple of the points that uh, Rabbi Shafran made toward the end of his presentation. In particular, and here I'm, I'm summarizing, the notion that um, <clears throat> uh, what he did not want to call Jewish pluralism, but called heterodox Judaism, uh, presents a challenge to the single standard approach or the, the commitment and the status quo agreement to uh, doing everything possible to avoid splitting the House of Israel first point. And then second point, would you care to respond to his comments about the Israeli Supreme Court uh, and its uh, arrogation, which, which of, of powers to itself, becoming in effect a legislature, if I understand the rabbi's points, which is uh, a, a charge certainly that we Americans are familiar with, uh, with respect to our own Supreme Court. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, David, sure. Would you like um, part of the part of this would be in a uh, very internal discussion about the nature of of Judaism, the understanding of what is tradition, uh, of what is our inheritance, of what became normative Judaism in the 19th century, in the 17th century, in the 10th century, in the second century. Um, for me, the Judaism is a living, uh, organic whole, which reflects both the will of what's called Knesset Israel, the will of the community of Israel, uh, in tension with, and made, I don't mean a negative tension, in a positive creative tension with the, the traditions which it inherits. Um, in that sense, I see political systems in a similar fashion. Uh, we in the America recognize that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of this country is, that claim all men are created equal, uh, meant all white landed, mainly Christian males. Uh, few of us today would attempt to uphold that, saying that that was the original intent of the Constitution. Even there, I think some of the more um, uh, conservative members of our, of our judiciary would not be willing to say that. Nor would we want to say that the fact that it was, it was signed in 1776 and 1789 based on the consciousness that existed at that time, would we want to make a claim that it should hold on us in 2007 uh, policy and, and uh, standard for this, what's normative for this country? So that's the first thing. I, I, uh, Israel is a miracle that it came into being uh, and dealt with many struggles in its inception. Uh, our hope would be that as it moves into its next decade that it's able to to think larger than to say because something was signed 60 years ago, we're going to use that as as the value for today. That's the first thing. As for the judiciary, you know, this is a complicated, it, to explain the structure, there is a religious court system and there's a civil court system. And the question comes when a decision made within the religious court structure and a decision made within the secular court structure find themselves in tension. Most probably, if we had uh, our own Barak here, he would talk about the ways that the religious courts arrogate to themselves a type of power uh, and control over people's lives that doesn't mesh with the, with the nature of Israeli democracy. So again, I would you know, make the same type of claim. Uh, I look at, the, uh, at this as a creative tension Bowing to the side of coercion, which Rabbi Melker would probably really is not only more gifted in this, but has staked his his life more than than any of us here on this issue, the issue of religion and coercion. And for most of us, that simply has to be broken. That nexus, which has done unbelievable damage, not only in the Jewish world, but across the board with every religious community, uh, is probably the most destructive force for faith and religion and religious life uh, that there can be. Uh, so those two issues for me um, are central, a living, vital Judaism that needs to flourish in Israel as it does in the rest of the world, um, rather than one that would atrophy based on, 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 a, on a particular period of decision making in time. And the second, as I said, on the, on the tensions between of religious rights uh, within the Jewish state. The third thing I have to say is, 
it, I, I, you know, I would agree with you that if the majority of Israelis want to have everything closed on Shabbat, uh, that's a fair. Women I in America had that too. Let's that should be taken to a vote. That's a simple thing. Let if if that is true, and the data that I have show the opposite. The two thirds of the of Israelis wouldn't. Have, but then may let that be a plebiscite if that were the determining factor of a democracy. I think the reality is that the present political structure of Israel doesn't allow for that type of debate to, be, to flourish, and certainly doesn't allow for that type of, uh, of, uh, of those types of decisions to be made, which returns us to the fundamental question of religion and power and control um, in general in Israel. I suppose what we didn't mention is if I were a Muslim secularist, what happens to me when I want to marry a Jew? I mean, you, you mentioned the Jew, but what happens to the Muslim? who falls in love, they brought up in a community, falls in love with a, there are limitations on his or her rights uh, as well because of this confessional system. And uh, therein lies this tension that needs to be, I mean, I leave that to you, needs to be discussed and debated within the state. Okay, living constitution, living Judaism to resolve these tensions, Rabbi Melchior. I, I want to bring us also back to the ground. We talked very high words of, of the systems and, and how it, the systems work, but people, but life has a tendency of solving many of these problems which we put up in, for example, the issue of marriages, which includes the questions which you took. By far and large, it's true that there is no that there are no civil marriages in Israel, and that uh, a Muslim, like the example you brought now, a secular Muslim or religious Muslim, by the way, with a Jew cannot get married in Israel. But uh, we found we find ways around it, Cyprus. as you know. <laughs> yeah, Cyprus. Cyprus. I was Cyprus. asked. I was asked to open a rabbinical office in Cyprus because the third biggest tourism of Cyprus, especially of Larnaca, is the Israeli marriage industry. <laughs> so that you have an extensive Israeli marriage industry, which, where people go to Cyprus for overnight and get married there, come back, and then the reform rabbi and the conservative rabbi, whoever wants the secular rabbi, which is a new concept which we're having now in Israel, are also performing then the marriages in Israel, and it's extensively used. And also ultra-Orthodox ministers of interior sign that these people are married. So I'm just saying that there are ways of life, including on the issue of Shabbat, which, by the way, I'm sad about. And I've offered uh, my Reform and Conservative colleagues to work together with us on this. I'm sad of the commercialization of the Shabbat. But in spite of the status quo agreement, which I also mentioned, which Rabbi uh, Shafan in, in extensively talked about. In spite of this, the whole Israel is becoming commercialized on the Shabbat with the big molds opening, which of course is threatening all the small shopkeepers and, and forcing a, a status of slaves in Israel, of people who have to work seven days a week in order to make a, a living, and are forced because they can't get a job without working on the Sabbath in a Jewish state. They're forced to. I think that this is. From, not from a religious point of view, from an ethical social point of view, a scandal. And I have offered the secular Israel, and also in legislation, I hope still that we can get through with that legislation, by the way, supported with, uh, by a few of the ultra-Orthodox members of the Knesset, not all of them, uh, a social contract saying, yes, we can, oh, we, let's make a new Sabbath where everybody will decide what kind of Sabbath he or she will have. But where we close down the commercialization of Sabbath, but those who want to go to the theater, theater, well, those who want to go to the beach, even by uh, some kind of public Shabbat uh, transportation, uh, which I, as an Orthodox Jew, and somebody believes in Halakha, of course, believes that it's not permitted on, on Shabbat to do that. But if they want to do it under, but still keep the notion of a Sabbath for everybody in the Israeli society. I think it's much better than the present situation by some kind of religious coercion, which doesn't work in any case, and for sure doesn't bring anybody closer to the Almighty. We had the discussion at the beginning of the 50s. If we should have circumcision by law in Israel, this would be by law both for Muslims, by the way, and for Jews. And there was a big, uh, big opinion in the Knesset for this. I guarantee you 
that if this had become law in Israel, we would have had 30% of Israelis going on eight-day trips to Cyprus. Right? <laughs> we would have gone away. Now, we don't have it by law, and we still have more than 99% of the Jews in Israel, at least, who, who get circumcised according to the Jewish, according males. To Jewish law. Jewish males. Yes, the Jewish <laughs> males. Yes, but, but uh, that's... But so, so I don't believe that religious... First of all, I th I'm against it by ideology. But I don't also think that it works. And, and the whole thing, the, the Supreme Court, it's also, it's a, mis it's, a, it's, a, it's a mistake. First of all, if we didn't have the power of the extreme court, of the Supreme Court in Israel, which is a unique power, yes, but not in this area. It's a mistake. In the, we would, Israel would not have existed today. I, I say with full response, I don't have the time to expand on this. But in the issue of amending the Knesset, the Supreme Court, with all the, the uh, Aaron Barak's amendments, in all of his years, as the total, there have been six amendments to the law, of which only one have be, has been significant. All the issues with, where the Supreme Court goes in and takes decision, and it doesn't want to, about non-Orthodox conversions, and many, many other issues. It's only because the Knesset doesn't legislate. There is a vacuum of legislation, and somebody has to legislate. Somebody has to decide what's the law. The Knesset doesn't succeed in making this decision, and the Supreme Court keeps on extending and extending and extending because it doesn't want to take the, the role of the legislature. And, and therefore, we have this, this unfortunate... Uh, what you should know, though, is that the tendency today in Israel the, the Orthodox Israel is getting stronger today. Maybe it could have been understood by Dr. Elkhart as being different. Than that. Author, we see it in the school systems, and we see it in, in the practice of Jewish religion in a, in a, in a, in a, in a very different way. The non-Orthodox are also getting stronger, but on a very, very small scale. Very, very small scale. I think it's not a question. It's not a question of the Orthodox. No, I don't think that the Knesset I'm not elected to the Knesset as a rabbi. I'm elected to the Knesset as a legislator in a, in a secular civil state, which I believe that Judaism should have a far bigger role in, but not Jewish law and legislation imposed. I think it's wrong. I think it doesn't work. And I think that if we took it out, this part of the status quo, which is the, the, the coercion part, which doesn't work, if we take that out of the system, then we can deal with the real substance, because it's a mistake to think that only questions of where you get married is Jewish. Once the creator of the Meimad party was the big, head of uh, the biggest uh, Esther Yeshiva in Israel, of Amitad, he was asked when he first ran for office if he was elected, if he would like to become the minister of religion. As a head of a big Yeshiva and a big rabbi, that would be a natural thing. He said, no, I would like to become the minister of health, because that's a much more Jewish thing. Now, I think that the, the, what, the ministry of, if the, what the ministry of religion, by the way, we've just this week reestablished the ministry of religion, which was a big mistake uh, this week in the Knesset. But what it's been, it's represented the establishment, the corruption, the worst parts of Jewish life. We have an enriched wonderful development of Judaism in the state of Israel with studying and learning and religious institutions in, in the positive way, religious responsibility, community responsibility, a, a, talk, a discussion about social responsibility, social democratic views, but very much from Jewish way of life, from Jewish learning, from this is a social contract which we need religious and secular Israel to, today together to gather on, which we can also establish good relations and models with this social contract with the countries around us. And, and I think that we have a unique chance of, of doing this. Let me just add one sentence to what uh, Dr. Elkhard also said, but I, I want to extend it beyond the, beyond the religious freedoms, and also freedom from religion, not only freedom to religion. Israel is a miracle also in the sense, and I, I salute Israel for this, Listen, we've been for 60 years. We haven't had one day of peace. We haven't had one day where not somebody 
has threatened to, to wipe us out. And still the measure of democracy, of religious freedoms, of, but also of political freedoms, also of, of, uh, of freedom of press and freedom of expression. We've extended the, the First Amendment here, <coughs> the freedom to say what you want. In Israel, if we've misunderstood it. We think that you have to say everything, <laughs> always. <laughs> and, and this is something unique also in Israeli press and in and the Israeli public debate. And I thank God for, for that uniqueness. Sometimes freedom of speech means keeping your mouth shut. I, yes, <laughs> you can't state that in the Knesset. You would be thrown out. OK, let's give uh, Rabbi Shafran a, a moment to respond, and then let's take a couple of questions. A moment? <laughs> <laughs> I'll need, I need several, but I, I, won't, uh, I won't do so. But, um, I don't know if you noticed the slight contradiction in what Rabbi Melchior just said, but he he pointed out two entirely contradictory things, and I think that in that contradiction lies an important insight. On the one hand, Cyprus is indeed a very, very short trip from anywhere in Israel. As a matter of fact, that one would have an easier time getting there than I will getting back to New York tonight, probably. Uh, it's an easy thing to circumvent the single standard of halakha with regard to marriage laws in Israel. It's done routinely. And yet, to use a word like coercion regarding the fact that there are such laws, had there been a circumcision law, which there never was, perhaps one could make the case that that was somehow coercive by forcing people who don't want to do something and have a good reason for not wanting to do it because it's a uh, it's a, an amputation of sorts. Uh, one could make the case that it's a coercive law, but to say that the standard of marriage used to a certain standard is no different from saying that there's a standard for citizenship, for instance, in our country. One can't just arrive on these shores, as many do, and say, I'm an American. There is a standard, and if one doesn't meet that standard, and it might involve blood ties, it might involve a course of study, whatever it involves, without meeting those standards, one is not a citizen. And likewise, when it comes to Judaism, and Judaism is a good deal older than 60 years, like the state of Israel is. It's uh, closer to uh, 3,000 years. A law that we believe, at least I believe as an Orthodox Jew, See, I was more than three. Well, three and a bit. Well, we're rounding off to the nearest millennium. But as an Orthodox Jew, I believe that that law has inherent importance more than that. It, the status quo agreement, which has been sort of belittled here by my colleagues, as something that, well, you know, it was, uh, laws can change. Well, yes, the Constitution can change also. But if you're changing a fundamental, foundational document of a country, that can't be done just on a spur, on a lark. There, that's why the Constitution can only be amended with an extremely high bar of, of popular feeling. It was claimed that there is such a high, that, there, that that high bar in Israel has been met by the populace's desire to uh, expand the definition of Judaism. I don't believe that that's true. I believe that most Israelis who responded to that poll had no idea when you tell them what is involved in Reform Judaism in terms of beliefs, they look at you like you're crazy and they say, no, no, you, you must be wrong. And if you tell them what humanistic Judaism is, then they, say, they send you to an insane asylum because they say, you cannot possibly be telling me that there's something called Judaism that doesn't believe in God. And you say, but there is. And they'll say that there isn't, and they'll turn away and walk away. There is a democratic system, and it works much like ours here in the United States. Anyone can say that, well, my representatives are not representing me because they are voting in Congress differently than I want them to vote. But the fact is that you elected them, and you can elect other people. I realize that Israel's governmental system has a lot of challenges and a lot of downsides to it. But the bottom line is it is a representative government. And if there was a strong feeling among the populace that they need to amend, so to speak, the status quo agreement, which, by the way, was the only reason why the Haredi ultra-Orthodox community signed on to the state of Israel. You amend that, you're courting essentially, I think, not civil war in a, in a physical way, but a, a civil social war. And I think that would be very dangerous for Israel. To uh, amend that document would require the populace of Israel to send to the Knesset enough members of Knesset who felt like-mindedly that they wanted to do that. I don't think anyone should hold their breath that that's going to happen, and therefore the status quo agreement cannot be made away with any more easily than we Americans can make away with the uh, 
with the uh, Constitution on which our government is, is based. A lot of other things I wanted to mention, but um, again, I think we should be hearing from others okay. in the room. Terrific. Than us. I, uh, I'm going to do a distinctly non democratic thing and extend this by fiat for at least 10 minutes. Those of you who have to leave, feel free to do so, but let's now go to the audience. I believe the gentleman here in the back. My name is Jonathan Silver. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Government here at Georgetown. And I wanted to um, try to ask the panel about the religious aspect. Heretofore, we've been discussing the sociological plurality within Judaism, various Jewish sects, various divisions within orthodoxy, non-orthodoxy, whatever. But he, even when we revert to halakha and the, the Jewish implication for policy, it seems to me that it's much more sophisticated than simply a list of dogmas. Because since Judaism is thousands of years old, it's always been a religion which has been defined principally by the, the, the whole institution of Chazal is debating back and forth. And even for the, we've been speaking principally about domestic complications, but even the foreign policy prescriptions in Maimonides, Sefer Malachim, and the book of Esther, and the book of Joshua are widely divergent. And Judaism doesn't have a, 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 a single unified view of many of these issues. So when one asks, what is the Jewish implication for domestic policy in Israel? I, I don't even understand what that means. What, what Jewish, what kind of unified Jewish view can one have without sifting through a much more nuanced and sophisticated? Okay, I'm gonna ask Rabbi Shafron if he would to answer that. I don't know that I can answer it. It's a very good question, a very good point. Um, there definitely are areas in which one cannot reach any conclusion, but the dialectic that is part and parcel of Judaism, as you described it, for millennia, has its limits. And you won't find in the Talmud that people will argue about uh, a, uh, an outright verse that forbids or permits or commands something that it doesn't mean what it says. Uh, there are times when we have a received wisdom that an eye for an eye does not mean a literal eye for an eye. But that's all part of what we call halakha l'moshem Sinai, or what we call part of the mesura that goes back to the beginning, the giving of the, of the Torah at Mount Sinai. But when it comes to a prohibition or a commandment, we don't find that there is a dialectic about, well, perhaps we should change that. And I think that in Israel today, even though I, I when it comes to military security issues, I don't think that most of the um, decisors of Jewish halakha today will put forth clearly a, a, uh, a direction to Israel's leaders. When it comes to religious issues, they definitely will. And there are recognized scholars of halakha. There's a scope, there's a span of them, but they are the recognized, uh, um, they're not elected, but they're recognized, which is better than elected. That means that everybody realizes that these are the people to whom one, ha one must turn for a halakhic decision. They will make decisions and they will give guidance with regard to religious issues. So I think uh, within that limited scope of religious issues, there is a, uh, an address to turn to. But the larger informing of Israeli uh, uh, governmental decisions, indeed, uh, I don't know what degree of uh, Rabbi Nalkir feels strongly that Judaism's ideals have to inform that, and I would agree. But what those ideals are and where they're placed, when the ideal of, of protecting life comes up against the ideal of showing honor to other peoples, there's going to be obviously some, some degree of range of, of how, how the chips fall. Okay, briefly. briefly. I, I just want to thank you for the question because I didn't have time to explain. And you're obviously right, but you're, you're right, but that's exactly what I meant. First of all, I, I define Judaism very broad. I define the Torah very broad. And the dialectic also of Jewish thinking in many of these questions, which are on the table today, not what is defined by Rabbi, Shaf, Rabbi Shafran as religious question. I don't, that's a very, very limited view of Judaism. I think that Judaism has a relevance for all the issues. It doesn't mean always one halachic opinion only. Can be many different. Can be different views, but I think on the table of the discussion should be the vast bulk of Jewish thinking, philosophy, halakha, in all of these areas. It's true we've been in exile for two thousand years. We haven't known how to drive a state, the economic systems, and so on. Even democracy, which I believe is an inherent thing of Jewish thinking today, it 
and can be proved and so also from Jewish sources, but it doesn't say it has to be democracy, okay? But what I'm saying is that when it's on the table of the cabinet, when we discuss selling weapons to uh, Pinochet's Chile, I think that the Rambam should be on the table. I'm not saying that there's no other interest, and also the Rambam would acknowledge that, that there are other uh, uh, interests and, and legitimate interests and ethical views, but this is, this is not on the table sufficiently today in the thinking of how we treat our sick, how we create economic policies, how, how, and also in the view of the other inside Israeli society. I think it should be on the table. I think we have sufficient material, dialectic material, to be relevant to the decision-making and thinking of, of the legislators. Jose? Um, I fully agree with the panel that there is no fundamental tension between democracy and religious establishment. The real tension, it seems to me, is between democracy, democratic state, and the ethnic nation. And the ambiguity of the definition of Judaism between Judaism as a religion and Judaism as an ethnic nation, or as a folk. And of course here, I mean, every, every uh, 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 branch of Christianity is established in European democratic states, not only Anglicanism, but Presbyterianism, in Scotland, every uh, Nordic country, uh, Denmark and Iceland and Greenland and Sweden until the year 2000, and the Orthodox Church in, in Greece. Greece Paradoxically, the Catholicism, the traditional established church, is the only one which is not formally established anywhere in Europe. But the point is that the issue is not that. The issue is uh, uh, Israeli minorities can become citizens of the Israeli state, but can, can never become members of the Jewish nation. And as long as you have this fundamental structure, even if they are full members of the Israeli state, they are going to be uh, second class citizens. And so the issue is. And here, Why are they going to be second class citizens? Because here the issue is closer to Germany, and where precisely the German nation is defined ethnic. ethnic. And therefore, you have the law of return of Volga Germans that have been there for 300 years, no, no German language, while a third generation Turk in German, who may be the greatest German writer today, is never yeah. a national. So this is, and, and it is the fusion of, of religion and nation. Yeah. And the fact that the modern nation state is a nation state that is the fundamental issue. Yeah, I, 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 look, look, I was thinking as I was listening to the conversation of Rambam and Chazal and Halakha, and I'm thinking for somebody who's not Jewish listening to this, they're going, it's not just that they don't understand the vocabulary, it's if we said, let's have a conversation about America, and we, were, we had a set of Christian clergy here arguing which Christianity should dominate in decision making, obviously most of us would, would find that at best unnerving and at worst terrifying. Right, we 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 often get upset when we hear a Christian in the Republican You're wrong, Party. David. Some of us do this for a living. <laughs> no, it's I, great fun. no, no, no. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. Sorry, I did. absolutely within this setting. I meant in the city in which you're talking about people who legislate for the country. So when we hear Christian candidates vying over whose Christian authenticity is greatest and whose Christianity will most inform their decision making because America is overwhelmingly a Christian country, that's the concern. And I do understand that. I have to say the, the other side for me in this is, because I've, I've, I've struggled with this. Uh, the other side of this is, look, there are many ways to construct a nation. I think a Germany that would make a decision that German ethnicity, I can make a stronger claim. My family came to Germany prior to the Crusades, right? But I never could be ethnically German because my family was Jewish. I'm, I would be hesitant, however, to stake the claim that any one model of state building is the only model. Israel is, is in that sense for me an experiment. Were Israel to be the totality of political structure of states, I probably would have to fight against it. But if it's one case of an attempt to think about constructing a country within the context of one people's historical and religious experience in which it codifies fundamental rights and freedoms to all people living there, then I think I understand the tensions, but I can live. I can live with those tensions. What would disturb? What disturbs me is when there aren't the tensions anymore. When one one source of power 
so resolves the issue so in such a determinative fashion, that's, that issue of coercion and power is what would concern me in any of the sitting. So when Nazi Germany, or, or even post-war Germany, turned, eth would turn ethnicity into an issue of coercion and power and control, that obviously, that obviously is, is going to affect me differently than what I feel is the circumstance of the state of Israel. First, I, I react to one thing that you said, Dr. Eichel. You think that it's terrifying for an American to hear. I just want to tell you, I was two years ago invited to an event just a, f a few mile from here or something like that called the National Prayer Breakfast. Okay? <laughs> I was invited to speak there. And there you had the whole public America. There was a majority of the Senate there. It was the president, the vice president, the football coaches, the president. Everybody was important in this society. There was an expression, an expression of religion there, which if were done in, in Israel, but it was we all, both the Jews, they acknowledged that we were Jews there, and Muslims that we all unite in Jesus. In Europe, in any European country, anybody would be thrown out. Of these kind of, it was an, it was a, I must say, uh, a, yes. a, a somewhat primitive expression <laughs> of public religion of, of commitment of the whole political establishment of this country in a very, very united, one way thinking religious form, which we in Israel, when we were asked, I was asked by the group here to start a prayer breakfast in, uh, in the Knesset in Jerusalem. We would never be able to do such a thing. But I did establish an equivalent, but we call it a study breakfast. Okay? And, we have, and we have Christians and Muslims and secular Jews and, very, and Orthodox Jews of all, kind, all kinds of Jews established as parts of this group. I'm just, I'm just saying it. So sometimes a little modesty also from Washington, even I can say it in this place. That's one thing. When it comes to what you say, I agree with you that under a very narrow definition, of an ethnical state, you can say that this contradicts the democratic principle, but then a vast attention. attention, but then that attention exists not only in Germany, but in the vast majority of democratic yes. states. Yes. But this tension ex exists, first of all, when it comes to the right to entrance to the state, which in any case can't be, in no country is, is a, let's say, a fully freedom entrance in, in, in no country in the world. The moment you are in the state and are citizen of the state, then, from my definition at least, of it being a Jewish state, also, from also where I agree with the Dr. Elchitz, also definition calls that this is the place where we have a, a, an expression of Jewish self-expression uh, and determination. But if it doesn't include both individual and collective rights for the minorities living in the states of Israel, both political and religious minorities. Living in Israel, then for me, it's not a Jewish thing. This is inherent in the, for my definition, inherent in the Jewishness of the state, also of the states of Israel. It's an ethical definition, an ethnic. Okay, right. Okay. All right. Let's let's uh, no, uh, let the question. Do we have another question? We have time for one more, right there in the back. Hi, I'm David Dinker. I'm with undergrad in the School of Foreign Service here. You spoke a lot about the issue of that Judaism should be more infused into the society of the state, which is heavily secular. Should this, should the government, this, you talked about, or Melchior, you talked about not having coerced religion or institutionalized religion in the law, and I agree with you. But should the religion, should the state be supporting kind of secular education, of, religious education in the secular world? For example, like Alma in Tel Aviv or Tashma in Jerusalem, um, these kinds of institutions that kind of fuse kind of Jewish. Uh, uh, Tradition text into the, into the public life. Yes, it should not be coercing. And the, today, according to the law, because of the faults of the status quo of 47, in a, in a public school in Israel, it's not secular, it's a public, in a public school in Israel, which is not defined under the religious system, if the school decides it wants uh, to study Judaism, and I differentiate also between study of religion and study Judaism under a pluralistic definition of Judaism, which is which, which is uh, different from the Judaism I practice, but not from the D Judaism I study. If they want to do it, they can't do it under the law of Israel. 
while, and that's why many more people now are in the religious educational systems today in the Jewish Israel, which is uh, uh, 72% uh, in the Jewish schools of Israel, um, the, of, of the children, 72% of the children. It's about 50-50, the, the Jewish religious schools and the state secular schools, in practice secular schools. I think that they should be allowed to study Judaism according to their definition of Judaism in the spirit of the institutions you said and so on. Yes, I think that the state should, I know that this is foreign from American thinking, but it's not foreign from Canadian thinking or from European thinking. Uh, I think that the state should encourage a debate and studying and texts and a debate of the Jewishness and what it means. I don't have, I don't have one solution for it the dialectic of what it means. But let's study it and let's know it. What's happening today is a polarization of the debate. You have the religious school systems which are becoming, which, where principles as, of, as democracy and humanism as more and more excluding civil studies in, are excluded more and more from the religious schools. And then you have a, a kind of a secular school where any kind of Judaism, under any kind of definition, is excluded, is not permitted. I think also that's a kind of religious insurance. I had a group now and this week in the Knesset. They wanted to have a prayer in a secular school in, in Ramat Gan. They wanted to have an afternoon prayer. They had to sign that they would not pray. I, I don't think that you can curse also against religion in, in the system. And if a school, if the parent body decides that we want Jewish studies in a broad, non-coercive, pluralistic sense to be a part of the curriculum in the school. I think they should have a right to do that. They don't have a right to do this under the present system in Israel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up here, but uh, I think uh, I can say on behalf of our audience that we've learned not only a great deal about Israel uh, and Israeli democracy and what you said, but uh, also in the way that all three of you have said it. So would you please join me in thanking you. Thank you all for coming.